Hello and welcome to How Robots Can Help Make Your AWS Accounts More Secure. Thanks for joining the community track. Um, just on a personal note, the community is one of my favorite things about AWS, so thanks for joining. Today I want to share with you how a small team can set a strong foundation to secure more than 600 AWS accounts. This team fully owns security best practices, but shares that responsibility and management with teams through incentives and feedback. This is my team, and we build out AWS accounts and manage security guardrails. Um, we also have to comply with regulated industry standards and compliance. Uh, so what is our secret? How do we do it? Robots. Um, just kidding. The truth involves more humans. I'm Margaret Valtiera. I'm a program manager at Morningstar. I'm an AWS community hero, and I run the Chicago AWS user group. So if you're in Chicago, please join us. Um, that's why I care so much about community. Um, Chicago is the best user group in the Midwest. Um, I'm also an organizer for DevOps Days Chicago. I'm on the socials at Margaret Valti, so get in touch. Today I want to talk about how our team does this at Morningstar. So we are a small group centrally for a big enterprise. Um, and just to set the stage, Morningstar is a leading provider of independent investment research. We're based in, in Chicago, but we have offices and colleagues in North America, Europe, Australia, and Asia. Our mission is to empower investor success. We do this through our independent research, ratings, tools, and data. On the technology side, Morningstar has over 600 AWS accounts for our product teams and builders. My team, Cloud Services, is a centrally managed uh, located group, and we are a group of just 17 people. We create and manage all things public cloud for those 600 accounts. So I'm going to share how we did it and where we are and um, some tips and tools for how to both incentivize teams to take ownership for those best practices, how we've done it through automated compliance and scanning tools, and then those AWS services and tools that we use to do that. So first, um, I want to give a kind of groundwork of our AWS account setup and how we have approached public cloud. The team began before I joined um, with some core concepts. One of the most important ones was a decentralized self-service model for public cloud. We wanted teams to be able to be hands-on and build directly. So Morningstar as a company is structured to keep teams and their products insulated. Uh, we decided to give teams their own AWS accounts. So that's how we got to 600 AWS accounts in our organization. About 200 of them are team or product level accounts. Um, and that's kind of split between business units or teams or products. So that's not very easy to scale or control. So one thing that we, we really emphasize from the start were stateful account configurations. We use Git and Terraform, for example. We segment team accounts by environment and account. And thanks to that infrastructure as code, they're relatively easy to spin up. We can offer teams secure, reliable infrastructure out of the box. It helps us create accounts quickly too. Um, I want to give a shout out to some of my colleagues, Dewey, Harvey, Siraj, and Advoot. They created six AWS accounts this week. We had a, a group who needed to build some new things, new products, and they stamped them out pretty quickly. It's pretty impressive. Um, one thing I do wish we'd known at the beginning was AWS organizations. It didn't exist when we started, but now that we've migrated to organizations and OUs, you can inform service control policies and kind of enforce some security from the start. So pro tip if you're starting right now. On the other side, we want to enable builders and developers to build and keep cost and security in mind. So to do that, we had to set some guardrails. One of those are IAM roles. So we scale those guardrails um, with those out-of-the-box controls. 
We have three standard IAM roles, admin, operator, and read-only. We don't allow teams to edit IAM roles directly. Uh, that would be a huge security concern. Um, someone could just create an account and then backdoor themselves right in. But to make it self-service, we do share that. Um, it's usually Terraform-based modules. We share those. And if teams want to create a pull request, they can view the code and submit a, a PR for us. We can review, and then they can kind of own their access. And that's come in handy as different AWS services need slightly different IAM controls. Uh, SageMaker or Glue are some examples. We also have standard network services. Um, we have limits on things like VPC peering. We just do not allow it. Um, it's a security issue. And we educate teams through that. Um, the final bit here for our public cloud strategy is cost management is really job zero. So budget is our budget approvals are our gateway into cloud. But on the same side, like we can't manage um, people's budget approval process without giving them visibility and awareness. So while we require teams to be responsible for budget and their processes, we want to give them access to understand their usage and infrastructure cost. We share and really encourage access to tools like AWS Cost Explorer. We use Cloud Health, and then Trusted Advisor is a great part of having enterprise support. Um, we get to share those insights with teams. And it's one of our core guardrails for cost optimization. It really does help understand usage, cost drivers, and cloud inventory. So for compliance reasons, I mentioned it makes sense to separate our P&L or business units into silos. But reality is pretty messy. Our teams vary in size, geography, budget, and AWS skills. So cloud services, my, my group, grew out of what was a center of excellence model. We're a group of cross-functional folks, everyone from architecture to a finance guru. We've got folks who specialize in security or the actual infrastructure as code. We're a peer of these P&L groups, um, but we aren't, we aren't stuck in one silo or another. So I think that really helps. I've kind of alluded to it, but one really important thing we included from the beginning was the financial aspect. Caitlin is our queen of cost optimization. She's a finance professional who knows the ins and outs of AWS pricing and optimization now. We joke, but she has definitely paid for herself just with finding financial oversights or some optimization tips. Um, if we could scale her infinitely, I totally would. All right, speaking of foundations, you're probably very familiar with this image, the AWS shared responsibility model. So we really like this idea and we wanted to incorporate it into as much as we could. So the things on the bottom in Amazon Orange are physical security of data centers, things like that, that Amazon provides and is responsible for. And everything on the top in Squid Ink is what the customer is responsible for in cloud. So Amazon provides security groups, but the end users are responsible for maintaining and locking them down. Same thing with data, encryption, things like that. So we built off of this for Morningstar's responsibility model. Um, we are regulated and compliance mandated. So we need a little bit more security guardrails. Um, I added the little red section for what we do. Cloud services and our InfoSec teams still need to control and manage some important aspects of AWS. We produce a lot of financial data, so we want to make sure that that extra security goes into things like account networking, operating system level access, and um, cost controls. So for example, I mentioned we don't allow VPC peering between VPCs. We don't want people to create new IAM users or roles. And we don't want teams using marketplace-based AMIs without someone from a central team checking in. 
We also want to keep a close eye on compliance things like publicly exposed S3 buckets, um, strange account activity, things like that. So in this red layer, um, I mentioned limited networking, security groups, um, and Morningstar AMIs. So I'll, I'll come back to those in a bit. We have these things in place, but to enforce our guardrails, we really need to encourage um, teams to take ownership and nudge those behaviors to follow security best practices. So when we started out with our enforcement, we wanted to do cost control as job zero. Behavior takes a lot of work to do. Um, so we wanted to base it in something really solid and offer a lot of guidance, documentation, and training. Another thing that we've learned through the process that I would highly recommend is our AWS enterprise support. So we have cloud services centrally. We can help field AWS questions and some troubleshooting, but really, we really do offload a fair amount of troubleshooting to AWS support. They offer 24 by seven phone, chat, and email support. So then my team can focus on long-term cloud projects and we don't get burned out just being support center. We also do a bi-weekly office hours with our account team. So a solution architect can dive deep into some hypotheticals. It also really helps us keep up to date. Um, you know, Amazon is drinking from a fire hose. So it helps to have someone else kind of watching the announcements and saying, hey, this might apply to us. So it definitely helps us share the burden of the kind of onboarding of cloud. It also enables our developers to directly interact with AWS account team. Uh, we may annoy them. I know we average at least 100 support tickets a month, um, but those range from just limit increases to business critical outages that we really do need help for. So that's been really useful. For us to kind of automate these guardrails, um, our team has also created a cloud services API. We scan through our team accounts and can find violations and anomalies. It allows us to create a kind of report card for teams. So we are Morningstar and we love a good rating or scorecard. Mike Allen started the trend with information security. He came up with scorecard scores. And we found it's a really great motivator for teams, not just public cloud, but also disaster recovery and um, just overall um, coverage for things like server information. So for cloud services in 2019, we introduced the cloud cost star rating. We pulled data from Trusted Advisor. Uh, we started with the cost optimization recommendations here. And this year we've expanded our cloud scorecard to include AWS security compliance scores. Things like disaster recovery, backups, AMI um, utilization, public S3 buckets, patching compliance, and EC2 instances in public subnets. So that first scanner, which focused on cost optimization, pulls data from Trusted Advisor. It's nice because we get to piggyback off of that data that AWS brings us. Um, and those in insights come with the benefit of being a trusted source. I, I mentioned this because I do have developers say like, well, why should I, who says this is required? Why do I need to optimize something? So they can go click in it in their own account and see what applies to them, which EC2 instances need to be optimized and how much it's costing them. So from that scanner data, we create JIRA tickets. It's how teams work at Morningstar. So we wanna do something that meets teams where they are. Each ticket creates, uh, is created for a violation, depending on the scanner and what we're recommending for remediation. So it's kind of, it's pretty small. I don't need you to read it, but it's a Jira ticket. It's got a lot of detail. Um, it's a cost ticket, and this one is for an un unattached EBS volume. I pointed out severity. So this one's high. We have different ratings and levels. Um, it gives some information too. We want it to be actionable and in informative. Down at the bottom, it says description. So that's a link to the wiki page that says what you can go, what you can do. Um, one feedback item we got was we needed more details. I think the first iteration said like 
this could use some optimizing. And teams were like, okay, well, what do I need to do? So now the JIRA ticket gives more information about what it is, the cost impact, and the calculated um, impact overall for that team's budget. So here it is rolled up into our scorecard. The JIRA ticket are calculated by issue type, impact, and category. Each team's score is reported in a different scorecard, and it's emailed out each week. If teams take action and remediate, their score goes up. If they don't take action, nothing changes. Um, in this example over on the right, um, that is our scorecard score internally, and that's cloud services. So of course we have five-star rating for public cloud. I just wanna point that out. <laughs> So Morningstar um, wants teams to be able to take action and understand what's going on. And it, the scorecard has, has really helped. Um, and it was a really creative solution too. For Morningstar, we kind of do scorecards, it's our thing. So it's really helped. All right, so I, I gave you the overview, painted the picture. Now let's talk about how the scanners work and our rating scores. First up, I'll talk about event-based triggers. And for the example, I'll go through our standard AMI enforcement. So because we have so many accounts, uh, we have to tr trust teams on some level. But we are regulated financial services, and there are some things we need to verify. So we want to trust that they'll do the right things and only use secure instances, but we have to go through and make sure that teams are actually using so Cloud Infrastructure Squad makes a set of AMIs or Amazon Machine Images. And our cloud security folks use our scanner to check all of our accounts and make sure it's actually in use. We want to limit the number of EC2 instances used. It will reduce our attack vector and it can simplify licensing costs. I also think it's pretty important to help teams get started in cloud. If you just go try to spin up any instance, there are tons of choices. So I think it does kind of help limit, okay, I'll pick from one of five. We want to include some exceptions for our scanning as well. Um, we want to limit it to certain things, but we found that creating an IAM role that doesn't allow someone to launch an instance is just too restrictive. So we kind of rolled our own solution here. We want to include exceptions for people um, doing a POC or testing something. Plus, it's pretty hard to scale across those 200 teams. So I'll start by talking about our Morningstar AMI. Um, a lot of our Morningstar customers require OS level security and control. So we do this by hardening an image. We provide that image in our standard hardened Morningstar AMI. We have Windows, Linux, and a couple other specialty flavors. Cloud Services creates it monthly. They build it with Chef, Packer, and Terraform. They roll it out to all accounts. And inside that AMI are configuration management, the latest patch information, and it's a, a hardened image. On creation, it triggers an SNS topic. So teams that want to update with the most up-to-date AMI can pull that into their automated deployments. We want to make it easy for people to do the right thing. So we do that and we want to trust but verify. And for this, I like to say we like to trust but auto-terminate. So if someone uses a, a non-standard AMI, we auto-terminate it. If a team launches an instance that's not standard, it will trigger a CloudWatch event. That event triggers a Lambda. Lambdas and step, step functions relay that information and it checks through um, a couple different sets of data to see if it's compliant, if it's an exception, and what AWS account it belongs to. If those checks fail and it's a non-standard instance, another Lambda gets kicked off and that, exception is, uh, that instance is terminated. If it's an exception, it's allowed to live on. So on the other side of compliance, we have time-based triggers. For this example, I'm gonna talk about backups. 
So our goal here is for ongoing compliance. We don't want to auto terminate a database that's launched without backups enabled. Um, that just sounds like it'd be very frustrating for someone if they are trying to launch something and they don't know why it's not working. Um, we also, also want to make sure someone could do a POC or if they're just doing a DR test, we don't want to get in the way. But at the same time, if a database goes longer than 90 days without a backup, it's a security issue and it's business continuity disaster recovery issue and it might breach a contract. So we have a time-based scan. It uses CloudWatch events to check for potential security issues after a set amount of time. We've got a couple of time-based scans that we're rolling out now. We're using it for backups for databases now. We also want to ensure any instance that's been around for a while that's long running gets constantly updated or patched. We also want to make sure teams are rotating their IAM keys regularly. Different teams or different products might have different rules for it, so we want to keep it flexible. Again, exceptions are pretty important here. And then uh, we also want to ensure encryption and transit for our load balancers. So backups are my example here. Our scanner runs by checking AWS backup service. We started by focusing just on databases. So that's RDS and DynamoDB. Other services might use S3 for backups, like EBS. So we didn't want to start and make it really complicated. Um, we also wanted to begin syncing up on-prem and AWS um, compliance rules. So all Morningstar AWS accounts have AWS backup service enabled, and it's pre-populated with a backup plan. So again, we want to make it easy for teams to do the right thing. We have backend audit scripts that scan team AWS accounts for those tags. And if it's tagged, it gets picked up under backup scanner or backup service, and it looks for the last execution date and the retention rules for that team. This event scanner runs weekly. Each new violation creates a JIRA ticket, really similar process from the earlier one. If a violation already exists, it doesn't create another ticket. Um, and then soon we'll roll these into the disaster recovery scorecard. Exceptions again, these are important here. Um, different teams, different compliance and retention policies. We also want to allow for if teams are doing backups in S3 or if they have some different rules for on-prem or something. When event-based triggers create a JIRA ticket, um, it has the potential to be very noisy, especially if it's a cascading um, backup. Hey, you still haven't backed up. So we don't want people to get annoyed with us or overwhelmed. If teams take action and resolve a ticket, it, the scanner runs and it auto-closes a ticket. Um, it boosts the scorecard when your tickets go away. But at the same time, it won't create more tickets. It won't keep piling up on teams. So here's the process for that database backup check. The scanner runs once a week. It starts by checking AWS backup service. Right now, we're focusing on RDS, Dynamo, DB, and S3. So um, RDS in this example, we want to check four areas. Is there a backup plan or snapshot present? Is there a recent snapshot in the last 14 days? Is it automated for backup? Is automated backups enabled? We want to make sure people check that box. We will also want to see if snapshots are mirrored to a DR region to make sure it's DR compliant. We want to make sure a snapshot is mirrored in the DR region. Um, we do that by checking the events in the past 90 days in CloudTrail to see if we can find the copy snapshot event. That will trigger CloudWatch events. Those kick off lambdas to determine the account required and which scan. Lambdas can get information about our account IDs from our Cloud Services API. That in the background, that queries a DynamoDB table. It's got team account information and contact info. That kicks off another scanner lambda. And like I mentioned, the JIRA tickets will be created for new violations. If violation already exists, it's, the ticket is just updated or continues existing. So what's next? We've unleashed teams to build with their own AWS accounts. Cloud services nudges developers to do security best practices. There's a lot more that we can do. We're rolling out more scanners. We want to do more detailed cost optimization. 
There are a lot more security vulnerabilities we can scan for and check. And we want to encourage teams to keep their data up to date. One of the biggest gaps in data for us has been the lack of a comprehensive ta tagging uh, policy. So from the beginning, we probably should have started with tagging enforcement or created some way that everyone building an AWS has tagging enforced. So we're, we're kind of paying the price by going back and starting over. Uh, but our hope is to do this kind of like the AMI scanner we have now. So if someone launches resources without tags, at some point we're going to auto kill them. Um, another thing that we're looking at is more complex analysis and workflows. We need to make sure we're, we're checking those exceptions and going back and reviewing. And hopefully we can get more metrics and areas to improve um, how frequently we deploy who's doing the best with cost controls and things like that. You say, that's great, now prove it. Okay, so we started scanning in 2019 with public cloud. Cost is the easiest thing to measure. We've found over $200,000 in cost optimization. So that is not including those exceptions I talked about. These are JIRA tickets where someone has taken action and remediated. So we found and I guess, recouped $200,000. Uh, the other side of it is a little harder to measure. Risk avoidance is hard to measure. It's hard to say how many security incidents we didn't have. But we found over 700 publicly exposed S3 buckets. So we have a, a manual process now of saying, hey, you have a public S3 bucket. Please go fix it. And then we'll, we'll automate that. Before our AMI scanner, we had maybe 60 or 70% compliance of people using our Morningstar AMI. Now it's in the 89 to 99% range. So we don't very frequently see the AMIs get terminated. Um, even still, this year alone, we've terminated 1,300 non-Morningstar AMIs. So we've learned a few key lessons um, and I would pass this on for anyone doing anything, especially comprehensively starting in cloud. Morningstar teams did a really good job starting with strong foundations and guardrails, the principles of sharing knowledge and making it self-service and approachable. It's really been helpful to share the, the knowledge and management with the teams. So cloud services doesn't get burdened as a central choke point, and we don't get caught as tech support and uh, people haven't burned out. We are expanding our automated scanning for best practices. Uh, we try to encourage teams to take ownership and understand. So we add links and documentation, but it's still a long cultural shift. We're not done yet. So thank you. Thank you for your time. If you're in Chicago, join the Chicago AWS user group. Find me online for questions. I'm curious how you and your teams are managing security enforcement and migration projects. Um, let me know. And if you don't mind, take the time to fill out the survey at the end. Thank you.